Welcome to Archery Talk 101 podcast, your guide to better archery skills. We'll bring you the latest tips, tricks, and expert advice, but that's not all. We'll also have interviews with top archers and industry professionals and reviews of the latest gear and equipment and much more. If you're talking about taking your art skills to the next level, a coach can definitely help you with that. I've been teaching archery for over 25 years. I'm offering a free 50-minute consultation call. Anybody that would like one, please fill out the form. I'll leave a link in the description so we can get to know you a little better and see if I can help you in your archery skills. Today we have a special guest on, on the show. Uh, hi, my name is Rory Canterbury. I'm going to be a host today on Archer Talk 101. And we have Jeff on the line with us. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure, for sure. Yeah, uh, could you introduce yourself and let the audience know a little something about you? Sure, I am. My name is Jeff Dysinger. I have been, uh, man, I've been shooting a bow since 1977. Um, so uh, I'm one of the few, well, not one of the, I, I am, I guess, one of the few people that have literally seen archery go from recurves to where it's at today. Uh, I know in in 77, you know, my I was 10 years old, my first hunt and was shooting an old McPherson 45 pound recurve with mismatched arrows and everything else. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, and then, you know, to my knowledge, the first real compound bow was probably Fred Bear's Whitetail Hunter. Um, somebody could probably, you know, Google that or whatever, but um, that was my first compound bow was a, a Fred Bear. And so, um, you know, what's weird is to think about how many deer I killed with that thing, you know, at such a young age and, and uh, you know, shooting a whopping probably <laughs> maybe what, 220 feet per second, maybe, yeah. um, you know, yeah, to, <laughs> yeah, you know, if that, right, that's true. Uh, you know, the six cables and all that mess and thing weighed about 14 pounds and um you know and, and then to where we're at today with all the technology and everything um but man i have i have literally lived one of the most blessed lives uh, an archery person archery hunter uh shooter could ever live so uh you know i'm just i'm really truly blessed that i got to to grow up the way i did and got to do the things that, that I ended up getting to do. And, and so, uh, no, it's, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. So, yeah. Yeah. So what, uh, what got you started in archery? What made you pick up that bow for the first time? <laughs> well, I will tell you that in Tennessee, that's where I grew up, uh, here in Tennessee. Um, I had an uncle that owned at the time was a camping center kind of thing and started to mess around with some outdoor stuff and and now he's one of the biggest outdoor dealers in middle tennessee now but uh, you know we didn't have any deer back then um uh, you know if somebody saw a doe even a doe that was a pretty big deal and then uh we were fortunate i had oh i don't know a lot of land to hunt uh through our family and whatnot but you know i grew up I was a bird dog, really. The first, <laughs> you know, my, you know, I, I got my first shotgun, I guess, when I was probably about eight or nine, and then. But before that, I was, you know, they would shoot quail and doves and and all of that, and I was basically a, a living human bird dog. <clears throat> um, and then, and then somebody gave my dad an old forty-five pound McPherson uh, recurve. And with my uncle having his store, I would get every broke arrow, mismatched arrow, and and um, and just got to where you know I'd start off with a hay bale and all that, and uh, got to where you know about twenty five yards I could group a pie plate pretty good, and um, and then started um, shortly after that we started the very first. It's called the Dixon County Bow Hunters Association in Dixon, Tennessee. And my cousin, Ricky, who now owns the Sportsman store, uh, he was a senior in high school, I think. And we have a place over here called Montgomery Bell. And 
um, he, he worked the deal and, and, um, we ended up building an archery range there and, and started having archery shoots. And that was way before 3d was even thought about. They were, gosh, I want to say they were old cotton bells with paper on there, and, you know, had the scoring rings and all of that. And so that's kind of how I, I got started. And then probably, Gosh, probably in like 79, 80, somewhere in there, I got my first compound bow, uh, which was that old white tail hunter and started shooting that. And then PSE kind of came out and um, <clears throat> it was kind of cool because here I am a kid, you know, teenager. And I'm shooting against the men and, and winning a lot and, and uh, learning a lot of lessons about <clears throat> psychology <laughs> i guess is the way to, <laughs> to say that because boy i mean they could say one thing and have you down another lane really quick and um and so my uncle helped sponsor me and got me my first psc and i want to say it was something like a mock flight two or three or something like that and and um you know it's a wonder nobody died back then because you know it was all about trying to get that speed because there was no speed limits and it was before asa and IBO and all of that and you know we're shooting um overdraws you know and, and shooting 16 inch arrows and, you know like <laughs> I said it's a wonder nobody died but uh you know something something if there's any young shooters on here especially target shooters man the next time you're at an archery shoot and you see an old guy like me running around go up and say thank you because they did all the testing for the crap y'all are doing today I'm just telling you yeah. right now. I mean, you can think all the all the bow manufacturers and all of that, but I mean, I mean, we literally had nobody to go to. I mean, nobody knew anything about the sport. You know, it was all hypotheses, and and so you know, trying to design arrows and rest and stabilizers and and all of that mess. I mean, you know, and the bows were, you know probably twice as heavy as they are today and, and probably three times as slow. So, you know, you're just trying to create that, that speed just to give you, you know, a little more consistency and whatnot, you know, and of course scopes and stuff like that weren't even thought of back then, you know, nobody thought about that. I, I remember when the pendulum site came out and that was like, uh, you know, I was like watching an alien land, you know, <laughs> it was something crazy. <laughs> yeah, so, it was. Yeah. But, you know, it was kind of it was kind of cool because, uh, you know, like I said, they started that Dixon County Bow Hunters Association in, in 77. And I was the youngest member at the time. And so I guess that kind of makes me the oldest member of the of the um, of the club now. Um, but uh, so we have a we have a place up here and I'm sure a lot of these guys on here know about it. It's called Land Between the Lakes. And uh, that's about an hour and a half, two hours from me where I'm at. And it's a it's a piece of property that the government has, and it spans Kentucky and Tennessee. And um, you know, back in the day, that was one of the only places you could find a deer hunt. You know, to where there was actually deer. And, and um, probably my biggest influence, you know, growing up was watching videos of you know Fred Bear and, and all of his hunts and stuff. And um, in 1981, um, I was, gosh, I was probably like 14, maybe. And so the Dixon County bow hunters, what they would do is they would pick a week during October, uh, usually the end of October, because it's closer to the rut. And um, of course, we didn't, you know, this was before, well, let me back up. So I got started before there was really you know compounds i remember when the baker tree stands came out that was my that was the best right. christmas everybody goes what was your best christmas i was 12 man i got a baker tree stand i got a new h and r single shot shotgun and you know got some you know camouflage that like we know today like the stuff i'm wearing now wouldn't even thought about then um i want to say that you know real tree and all those guys they didn't they didn't come out until, gosh, um, I'm guessing maybe like 83 or four or something like that, maybe. But in, in 1981, we were all down there and, um, 
of course my dad would take me to all these and I had cousins and uncles that were a part of it. And so you just got, I think it's, I hope I'm not misquoted, but I think it's like 190,000 acres that spans Tennessee and Kentucky up there between uh, Lake Barkley and the Tennessee river. And so, um, so what they would do is they would just drop me off in a, they, they had corn fields or bean fields and, and you'd basically just pick a field and go up there and try to set your tree stand up and hunt. And, and so I was one of those kids, you know, from the get go that would, I'd, I'd get there before daylight and they would pick me up at dark, you know? And so that was my Colorado, my Montana, my, you know, that was, that was my wild place, you know, back then. And, and so in 81, I had killed this little bitty six point, but he was huge to me. He probably he wasn't even a hundred inches probably, but he was a giant to me. And, uh, I shot him about <laughs> I shot him about three o'clock in the afternoon, and so by the time I got down, I'd only killed maybe one or two deer before that, and so here I am trying to field dress him by myself and all that, and I'm trying to pull him across this cornfield, and I I probably don't weigh a hundred pounds, and so I'm not even halfway through this cornfield. It's dark. I'm afraid that they're gonna miss picking me up. You know, there, you know, we really didn't have flashlights back then and that kind of stuff, you know, like we do today. And, and uh, so I got to the point where I would take my tree stand and my bow and go about 40, 50 yards, drop it off, come back, pull the deer to that. And so I was, you know, just kind of leapfrogging it, you know, and I'm in the middle of this cornfield. It's dark. And out of nowhere, I hear this voice behind me that says, son, you need help? And I said, no, sir, I got it. I was scared to death. I didn't know what it was. And, and, and he goes, no, you need help. I've been watching you for the last 45 minutes. He goes, you need a lot of help. And I'm like, he goes, grab the tree stand and grab the bow and let's drag this deer. And I'm like, okay, well, we're in the dark. And so we get there and my, and my dad pulls up and the headlights hit and it's Fred Bear. Fred Bear helped me drag this deer across this cornfield. And I didn't really understand who it was until he goes, well, I'm glad to see you're shooting one of my bows. And I'm like, Fred, I even had like Fred Bear's hat on, that little goofy Robin Hood hat he used to wear. Yeah. And uh, I even had one of those on. I mean, that's how big of an idol this guy was to me. And I'm like, oh, my God, you, you got to come back to our camp and because nobody will believe me, you know, and, and all that. And sure enough, he did. He came back to the camp and, uh, you know, so he was with, uh, oh, I can't think of the guy's name now, but they were up there hunting um, fallow deer. That's when you could still hunt fallow deer and land between the lakes, which is pretty cool. So, um, so anyway, that happened, you know, with him, and, which was really cool. And um, so in 1990, I'm trying to think the first year that ASA started, I think it was 93. Um, I was in the arm. Uh, no, I wasn't. I wasn't. In the, I was in college. Um, and ASA had come out. They said they were going to start their ASA tournament and all that. Well, I didn't. I wasn't shooting the pro class. I was shooting like, I don't know, like one of the other classes, like A, the limited A or unlimited A or whatever it was. And messed around and won. And it was down in Gainesville where Fred Bear has his archery center and his museum and all that. And he was actually giving out the trophies and the checks for all of that. And when I got to shake his hand, I asked him if he remembered me. And sure enough, he did. It was, I mean, he didn't know who I was then, but once I told him where we met and all that, he's like, heck yeah, I remember that. So, so that was kind of always one of those things, you know, that just kind of stuck with me and, and if, if my dad were here right now, he would tell you that I've quit more good jobs to deer hunt than any person that he's ever met uh, when I was a kid. You know, I would work at like Captain D's and I'm like, hey, I need Saturday and Sunday off. And they're like, no. And I'm like, well, I'm, I'm done. So because it's, you know, it's opening day of deer season. So <clears throat> but um, no, so graduated, you know, graduated high school in uh, 85, um, you know, during during those years i learned real young when i was 16 and was able to drive that all these farms that all the like my dad and my his friends would try to hunt they wouldn't let them hunt 
because, you know, they're grown men and whatnot. And I would go up and knock on the doors and here's this 16 year old and I'm telling them I'm on a bow hunt and they just kind of laugh at me. And they're like, yeah, if you think you can kill one, go ahead. And so I got to where I was killing big deer and uh, at a young age and kind of got noticed doing that. And, and then of course the archery tournaments and stuff. And, um, you know, I ended up winning uh, ASA shooter of the year. I've won it four times, like 94, 95, 2002 and 2010. Um, and what's really funny is, you know, I shoot for Matthews, but all of those are with a recurve, every one of them. So, um, and, so this year kind of marked, um, I, I kind of, when I went in the woods this year, obviously I, you know, I, I bow hunted with my Matthews, but there was one hunt in Kentucky that I, we have a farm up there and, and uh, got some, some really good friends of mine that I hunt with came up and I broke out those stick bow and regretted it. I'm not going <laughs> to lie. I, I had, I had two or three bucks come in and does and just were just out of range where it would have been a pop shot with a, you know, with a compound, you know, and, uh, but it was fun to, to put one in my hand again this year. So, yeah. So I, I kind of range all over the place with <laughs> when I love shooting traditional, but, you know, I also love shooting compounds and everything that that brings to the table. So. Yeah, but yeah. Different, different world when you pick up the traditional bow as opposed to the uh, compound. Yeah, especially when you hadn't done it in a while. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a totally different game for sure. But I, I will tell you, I mean, putting a recurve or a longbow in your hand and you're out there hunting, I, I mean, it it really does make you hunt a lot harder, you know, and, and yeah. you, you have to become more stealthy and, and that sort of thing. <clears throat> so that was that was a fun challenge you know it, it was fun to know that i got close enough to you know if, if i'd had a compound it'd been done so but i mean the first elk i ever killed was in 94 and um uh, i killed in in montrose with a uh, i what was that i want to say it was one of those martins like savannah longbows or whatever and it was my first time out there. And back then, you could kill any elk. You'd kill spike or, you know, a regular bull or a cow or whatever. And, um, you know, I ended up shooting a spike at, like, five yards. And I, that was the greatest day of my life. You know, I, I, I thought I had really hit the big time when I did that. So, but – and then I ended up moving to Colorado in 95. So I went in the Army in 85 and – and uh, was with the 75th special forces down in Fort Benning and then um you know went to college and then after college I came back to Nashville and kind of bummed around Nashville I've always been a musician and so I, you know played music and did this and that and um and then in 95 I, I moved to Colorado and um became a guide a big game guide with Pikes Peak Outfitters there and uh that, I mean, that was, that was always a goal of mine was to, to go do that. You know, you know, I read all the, the magazines and all the stories about Colorado and, and I uh, got out there and man, I was in my element when I was there. So I got it there. Um, I actually messed around and won God of the year, 96 and 97. Um, that's also the time, about the time I met Aaron Snyder. And so Aaron's a big traditional guy. And so we would shoot some of these, you know, like the CBA and, and all of that, um, which I'd like to give a shout out to those guys, man. They're doing some good work right now. Colorado's trying to make every, um, every unit a draw unit. And so you, you're not going to be able to go out there and, and just buy over the counter tag. And so they're, I think they're on our side on that one, trying to to keep some over the counter units going because I mean that would, I mean I get why they're trying to do it, but it's, I don't know. I'm still passionate about out west, you know, Colorado, Montana, especially Arizona and New Mexico. I mean those places are just elk meccas, and of course mule deer hunting. The, the one you see behind me, that's a that's about a hundred eighty inch muley I killed. I don't know a few years back and uh 
on a spot in Stockton, Colorado. So, but, you know, I lived out there for up until, oh gosh, 2015, I guess it was. Um, in 2002 or 2003, I started a glass company out there. And, and uh, you know, I just wanted to be out in the elk woods and, and you know, of course, mule deer and bear and all that. And, and uh, so I, I was in Pagosa Springs for years and, and really got to know that area and, and whatnot. And, and so, um, you know, just did a ton of elk hunting. It, I will tell you when you're shooting the tournament circuit, it's really hard to shoot, you know, to go do that from those areas. Cause I mean, that's a real commitment. You're on a plane and I mean, you're not going to drive 25, six hours to go shoot tournaments. And so, you know, you get on planes and do all that. And so, you know, these guys that are doing it today, of course, Tim Gillingham, he's kind of a different animal. I mean, he can afford to do it. Back then, I couldn't. It been so it was a real challenge for me to to have to, you know, do my schedule and, and all of that. And so, uh, and so in 2015, I also play a lot of golf. And uh, so in 2015, sold the company and, and moved to South Carolina and went and got my PGA card and, and um, moved. I wanted to get back to Middle Tennessee. And uh, so I took a head pro job in Kentucky up in a little town called Benton, Kentucky. And I uh, was the head pro there. And man, loved being back in, you know, in the South, just closer to all the tournaments and all that kind of stuff. And to all the guys I hunt with, I, I've, I've only got like three guys that I really hunt with. Uh, as far as travel and, and hunting, um, I'll give a quick shout out to Justin Walski. He's in Michigan now, but he and I grew up together and, and uh, he's kind of our tech guy, man. Any new stuff that comes out, he's on it. And, uh, you know, he's, he's, although I've known Aaron a lot longer than he has, you know, he does a lot of stuff with Kafaru and, you know, Mountain Ops and those guys. And then there's two brothers here in Franklin where I live. Um, actually Brock's in Memphis now, but Brock and Chase Gilbert, um, I met them on the side of a mountain in a wilderness area in Colorado about five years ago and saw their truck there. And it was their very first time elk hunting and, uh, you know, got them on some elk and we just since then been really good friends and, and, uh, good hunting partners. I kind of hate them sometimes because they're young, <laughs> they're like in their thirties and, you know, and they're like six two and six four, and so when we're in the mountains, I threaten to shoot them in the leg all the time just because I can't keep up. So <laughs> I I turn fifty six tomorrow, so <laughs> that's so that tells you where that's at. So, but anyway, but I I still pride myself on being able to still get out in the mountains and hike, and you know backpack hunting is kind of my thing. And you know I was I was doing that before it was cool, you know. Um, and so, you know, Cam Haynes, I, you know, I've, I've seen him on mountains years before he ever became, you know, the, the editor for uh, Eastman's bow hunting journal. And so, I mean, but he's, man, that guy's taking it to a next level for sure. So, but, um, you know, in all my years of doing all that, I was, I was, off, you know, really lucky and, and blessed to get to guide some really cool people you know, out at Pikes Peak, um, you know, we didn't have giant bulls out there, but we did have giant mule deer and we owned a lot of property out in Eastern Colorado. And so, you know, I got to, to, to guide General Schwarzkopf, um, actually got the opportunity to guide, uh, Ted Nugent for two days, which was kind of cool. Uh, Bill Winky, outdoor writer, you know, so not like, I mean, some of those names are huge, but, you know, but then I got to guide hundreds of just regular guys like us that, you know, when they do encounter an animal like that, they're so appreciative. And, you know, and, 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 and being out West in, in that environment, you know, it, it really changes people's lives and perspective on, on what we do, you know? And so I was always one of these guys that never took it for granted where I was at. I, um, you know, I, I remember my first time going out West and what, how that made me feel and, and how free and all of that it was. And, and so anyway, I, uh, 
you know, I, I, I strive to, to encourage that when I guide and, and uh, you know, still today when I talk about backpack bow hunting and all that, you know, I, one of the things that I've always strived to do is to give back to the sport because it's given me so much. I mean, I've met some of the best people in the world through the sport of archery and I mean, life, lifelong friendships. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm really blessed to have been able to do that. So, but I will tell you, we're talking about Aaron Snyder. Man, I love that guy to death, but I will tell you that he and I have almost come to blows a few times on an archery course, shooting <laughs> traditional. You know, you, you, you think these guys with compounds get serious, man. That guy gets serious about it. <laughs> and usually when he walks into a tournament, he – I mean, I guess you got to kind of have a little bit of a cocky side to you if you're, if you're there to win. But, uh, man, I would always – he and I was always butt heads. We would always go head to head. And so we, we've had some pretty good battles out there. So, and, uh, and so seeing what he's become and what he's done today is, you know, it's just so cool to be able to, to say, I knew you before all that, you know? So and yeah. to see how he's handled success and, and, and what he's doing with his company is pretty amazing right now. So, but <clears throat> yeah. So, I, like I said, I've just, I've been really blessed. Yeah, it sounds like you've had some pretty interesting hunts and, you know, meeting some really, really cool people in the industry. And, and yep. you know, I, I met Ted Nugent a couple of times. Uh, he kind of a, a nice guy. And, um, you know, I haven't met too many of the other guys in there, but, you know, I did meet him. And, you know, that was, that was nice. Got to talk to him a couple of times. And, and, you know, that's always nice when you can do that. But, you know, like you said, you know, the the regular guy is is just so appreciative. You know, when you go out someplace like that, and you've got a guy that can actually get to where you can see him. Yeah. You know, as an archer, it's like I may not be able to get the shot, but at least I can see him. We can get right. something going. And you know, I I know when I first started, um, you know, deer hunting, it it was it was a good day if I see prints in the dirt. <laughs> right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There, there's been a lot of hunts where I'm just glad to find a track. You're right. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, but. and then when I when I started, there was there there was you can only get two two tags. That was it. You can only shoot two. Okay. And and they had just changed it because it was just one, you know. Mm -hmm. And the I don't remember the 50s or 60s when they went to two, but it was one and prior to that. Right. Yeah. When I started, I'm a little bit older than you. I'm probably about 15 years older than you are. Okay. Um, yeah here here um a few more weeks i'll be turning 68 so oh good for you <laughs> yeah. that's all i i i know it is like you get the young kids they like, running up down the hills and it's like okay wait a minute slow down here i'll keep up you just gotta slow down <laughs> yeah with these guys yeah. i hunt with i'm like hey let's just pick a spot on the map i'll see you when i get there <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. just let them go you know so yeah no it's yeah. it's one of the things that's really we were just talking about this the other night. I mean, <clears throat> the way things have changed over the last 20 years has just been amazing. Um, and gear, just gear alone. I mean, I remember when I would backpack hunt and my pack would weigh 60 pounds, which kept me from going deeper and deeper in the woods, you know. I mean, you know, tents weighed six seven eight pounds sleeping bags weighed five six pounds and you know now i'm <clears throat> i don't even use a tent anymore i use a hammock and a tarp <laughs> so you know and then my sleeping bag weighs like i don't know maybe two pounds and so you know all the gear and and the the evolution of hunting has just changed so much and i think that's probably what bothers me most with what colorado is trying to do because you know, there's still guys out there that, that haven't gotten out west to elk hunt. And, of course, Colorado has always been the easiest place to do that. And now they're wanting to do a draw system. And, oh, my gosh, I don't even want to get into that. I mean, I wish Justin was here. If you ever wanted to talk points and draw systems and all that, Justin's the guy to talk to. And, and the guys at Elk 101 are, are amazing. Corey and, and Randy Newberg and them, I mean, they – 
they really know their stuff and what they're talking about when it comes to that. You know, I, when I was guiding a lot, we would go to all these shows back East and, you know, I would do all the elk calling contests. I've won a few of those and, you know, won a bunch of turkey calling contests, but, you know, nothing, nothing to brag about really, but, you know, getting to meet Corey when he was first starting out, Corey Jacobson, you know, and I mean, these guys are, you know, they're next level callers. And, and I'm one of those guys that, you know, if an elk bugle is, I'm more of a, how do I get to him than calling to me kind of guy. So, um, but it's, it's been kind of cool. I've been, you know, I've been real successful and, and, you know, I've killed probably, Oh gosh, I don't know with a bow and all I do is bow hunt. I don't, I don't gun hunt ever. I, I figured that by the time I get to where I can't pull a back a bow is when I'll start gun hunting. So, but now that they have crossbows, how do you even start doing that? So, but, um, and I have a love hate relationship with those too. I, I don't know if that's bow hunting or not, but I, I do like the fact that it does put younger hunters in the field earlier, I guess. I guess that's probably one of the benefits to it. And it helps old guys, you know, that can't pull back a bow anymore. So there's that benefit, but you know, other than that, and the and the accuracy. I mean, there's probably less deer being lost to to crossbows than than back in the day. But I don't know. I just have a love hate relationship with crossbows. I I don't even know why. I guess so, <laughs> so, it's just easy to hate. <laughs> so, yeah. But, yeah. Well, I know well, when I when I had my store, you know that those that wanted to shoot a crossbow, they might have to bring their own target because right, you know, the yeah, normal one I had may not stop they may, may get buried but you know yeah. my idea is a stick with a string playing another stick as archery yeah. yeah so does it fit in that category it's archery and yeah that's true yeah yeah and, I, and like you can say it's it's good for you know the younger kids you can get out there and have mm -hmm. good you know good penetration and right. you know less chance of losing them uh, or for the person that just doesn't have the time you know, to get right. good. That's you know, true. I'd rather them shoot a crossbow than not spend the time to get good enough to hit what they're shooting at. And that's I've a great that. point. I've seen that several times where, yeah, uh, why are you trying to shoot a 40 yard shot? You can't group six inches at 20. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right. You're right. Yeah. You know, you, you need to listen to me. I'll teach you how to get better. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, that's, that's one of the things too, that kind of miffed me a little bit is, you see some of these guys, you know, the Levi Morgans, you know, and I'm just going to name a couple. I'm not trying to name drop or anything about that. But what I'm trying to do is prove a point with with accuracy. I mean, you got Tim Gillingham, you got Levi, you got Dan McCarthy and Chance Bobo. I have a really cool story about him. But, uh, you know, and, and, and I've been lucky enough to, to have done this long enough that I love shooting long distance stuff. And I filmed, and this has been years ago, but I, I filmed, we were hunting in a really neat area in Colorado for antelope, and it, I think to draw a rifle tag is like 19 years. It's that kind of place, but for an archery tag, it's like eight, I think. And so I've got this tag, and I've been hunting this giant buck for like a week and couldn't get him, and so at like two o'clock in the morning, I went and set up a blind in the middle of nowhere because he'd been coming across this little hill every morning. And so it was my last day to hunt. And he walks out there at like 104 yards, no wind. It was early morning, everything. And he was broadside and I shoot him and we film it. And man, the, the blowback I got from that. It was like, oh my gosh, how unethical are you? And blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, he ran 50 yards, you know? <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I want to say Gillingham shot a moose not too long ago at 100 plus yards. You know, you see, you see Levi smoking deer or sheep or whatever at, you know, 80, 90 yards. The thing is, 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 is just what you said. You've got to take the time to become good and practice, you know, and you got to trust your equipment. That's the biggest thing. I mean, I have some of the coolest sponsors ever. I mean, you know, Matthews and Bowfinger and Vortex and, 
you know, go to, I've been with go to ever since Gillingham's been with, you know, started all that. Um, you know, Q2I is kind of a new one for me. They're a new vein company. They've been out a few years now and, um, uh, you know, they're putting out some really cool stuff. And I, I'm one of these guys that if, if it doesn't work, I, I don't need to be, I don't need you as my sponsor just because I need a sponsor. And so a lot of my sponsors, you know, I've been with for years and years and years, you know, I was with Vortex when they first came out. So um, I know they get a lot of stuff going on, but they've always taken care of me. So, but, um, you know, camouflage is, is, you know, another thing that's changed over the years. That's really just been a crazy conversion. I mean, I remember when, um, I mean, when I first started, and I know it's for you, I mean, there was no such thing as camouflage. I mean, unless you found an uncle that had some old military stuff, you know. But, uh, man, when Real Tree, I think it was probably Real Tree was the first one out, wasn't it? I think. I think so. I remember yeah. that, the, the gray and, and uh, what was the it? The tree kind bark. A, a black, yeah, the tree bark one. Yeah. I've still got some of that camo around here someplace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah I, and, you know when that came out man I, I thought I, when I got some of that I thought I was somebody then you know I was in high school I think so but um yeah the, matter of fact the guy that started ASAT he's from my hometown in Dixon so he since sold the business to whoever has it now but yeah I mean when his stuff came out we're like how in the heck is that supposed to work you know and and apparently it's it's good stuff now so but anyway so you're, you're in Nebraska, right? Yes. Yeah. So I need to come up there and, and uh, take advantage of y'all's turkey season up there. <laughs> so. Yeah, we, we we have some nice turkeys up here. And I've got a flock that I got to start monitoring uh, that's like a mile from my house before just for the highway on the road nice. out of the little village I live in. Uh, can't hunt that field that I see them in all the time. <laughs> but I got to start tracking down where they're going and where they're coming from because uh, I can hunt across the road. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I got you. Wow. No, I've I've been real fortunate when it comes to turkeys. I've slammed three times. I've done it. I've done it. Obviously, the first time with a shotgun, but the second time I did it with a compound bow, and then the last time I did it, I did it with a recurve. So. Um, so I've, I've been real fortunate to, to get to do that. So, but I, uh, man, there's nothing harder in the world than hunting turkeys, you know, with a bow and not in a blind, you know, that's, oh, yeah. yeah, I mean, it's almost impossible. So, but, uh, anybody wants a real challenge, there's your challenge right there, you know, and anybody can do it. So, you know, or anybody can go try to do it. And so right. it's one of those things that, you know, you, you want a real challenge in your life, go turkey hunt with a bow. So but it's the hardest <laughs> yeah. thing you'll ever do. <laughs> so, well, but, well, when you think about how big is your target, you know, if you're going for a heart shot, how big is yeah. the heart? Maybe an um, inch? I was going <laughs> to say an inch and a half. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Right, so. so you got to be dead on. And, you know, that's why a lot of, them, you know, the guillotine come out and, and the, the ones that, you know, the big wide cut ones and then just, you know, go for the head or the neck. And, you know, that's, that's a bigger target. You know, you wouldn't think, oh, the, the next little target. No, it's actually the biggest target. <laughs> I wish there was a, I wish there was some way a percentage or, or have somebody call in, like how many blinds have guillotines messed up? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I will tell you when those first came out, I was in a blind and I mean, I had a turkey at like five, 10 yards. It wasn't paying any attention. And man, you're talking about ripped up a blind pretty good. That was that was pretty good. So but you find that percentage out, you you'd be doing something. So yeah. But, well, well, when you look at it, it's the really short shots, you know, your your five oh, yeah. yard shots and, and, and your five and seven feet shots, you know, those real close ones. <laughs> Very few people can actually make those shots because they don't know how to shoot them. Right. Yeah. And then when you're looking at it, because you know, you think, oh, I just, I had some guys, I was at a tournament and, and it was up on a platform. There was a gator, like almost right down next to, the, to it, you know, like you'd be in a, a race platform. Yeah. He was actually out gator hunting. And 
Everybody says, well, I'll just, I'll just sight down the arrow. No, have you ever done it before? No, I'll just sight down the arrow. Yeah, well, that don't work. And no, it doesn't. <laughs> I, I knew on, on my bow, you know, that distance, because I had, I had all the, the stuff laid out. So I knew exactly what range, you know, how to shoot them. And, like 60 you know, yards? My, well, I was my 70 yard pin yeah, at that yeah. distance for it. And so I'm up on the platform and I'm leaning over. I, I come up my form, you know, because you always, you don't drop your arm. That's not your form. So right, I'm bending yeah. at the waist, banging at the waist, bending at the waist. And I've bent over so far that <laughs> I finally get my 70 yard pin on it. And then, you know, then I go through and finish executing my shot, hit it right where I'm supposed to hit it. And now then I'm leaning over so far, I have to grab the pole and pull myself back up the, the, on the rail. Because I was over wow. so far, I couldn't straight back up. <laughs> wow! You know? Yeah. But when you when you think about it, where's the arrow? The arrow's at your mouth. Yep. Straight out from there. Where's your pins? Uh, by your eye. You know. That's right. You know, three inches higher or so. You know, yep. roughly there. So your pins are three inches higher than your where your arrow is. So of course it's going to be shooting real low. Right. And, and yeah, you know, you're like everything else. It kind of rises up. And then drops. It is like on a, a gun, a projectile, the bolt actually rises and then drops. So, right, yeah. you know, like with sighting and rifle, I, I go to the indoor range at, at 26 <clears throat> yards. I sight dead on on it. And on my, my OT6, I'm, I'm about uh, uh, at two inches yeah. high at 100. I was, was going to say two, about yeah. three inches and about three inches <laughs> over 300. So I'm sighting at 26 yards. I'm, I'm dead on to 300. You know, yeah, you know, for a deer within three yeah. inches of where you're hitting, you know, that yeah. that's nothing. Uh, you know, have the same thing in archery, except it's like closer ranges. Right. Yeah. You know, I found on a lot of my bows, my 20 yard pin is about an inch off at 10 yards. Off how? Uh it's just it's just off, it's just off about an inch. So I just have oh. to hold off just about an inch if I want to hit dead on at 10. Oh, I got you. Oh, at 10. Yeah, okay. I got yeah, you. At 10, yeah. 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 So okay. so now then then at 20, I'm dead on. And then so there's no reason on my bows to put a 10-yard pin because right. it's fast enough that I don't need to worry about it. Right. Now, if I was shooting 50 pounds or 45 pounds, yeah, then you might need a 10 yard and 20 yard, 15 and and, and that's on. like that but, big buck I killed last year in Kentucky. It was right in the middle of the rut. And I mean, there was bucks running everywhere. And the one that I had kind of a target buck, he kind of got in the woods and I grunted and he came and he ran and he stopped three yards from the tree I was sitting in. <laughs> and I mean, clear shot and it's straight down. And I'm like, I'm not sitting there doing the conversions in my head. I'm like, you know what? I'm going to shoot my 60 yard pin and, and just, and so boom, you know, and, and of course it worked out, but you know, it's funny. So you was talking about Chance Bobo from a while ago. So he he and I kind of grew up around here. He's a lot younger than I am, but um, back when he was starting to shoot in the pro class and stuff, you know, we would always see each other at tournaments and whatnot. And <clears throat> and then of course the ASA happened, and and uh, we've always been friends. And so um, he was married to Emily McCarthy, <laughs> uh, but he he and Emily were married at the time. And he calls me out in Colorado and goes. Hey man, uh, I drew a, a deer tag. Me and Emily both drew. He goes, I'm gonna grab a deer tag or elk tag. I'm like, all right. So we go up and we're hunting, you know, above Timberline for four, five, six days. And uh, and so, um, it, and we were on one particular buck. We just never did get him. And and that and so here's the funny part. He goes, Hey man, can I come deer and elk hunting? I'm like, Yeah, sure. So, you know, if you called me and said, hey, I'm coming, I'm taking a week, 10 days. This dude was at my house for 28 days. Like, oh, you know, like yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, most of the time we were out, you know, we were spike camping and doing all that. So after about five or six days, you know, at 13,000 feet, we, we go back to my place and, you know, kind of regroup and, and re, you know, refuel and all that. So the next day we're going to go elk hunting. And it was the funniest thing. We so we go elk hunting and there's one particular place that I go and you you hike in about a mile and a half two miles and and when you get to this bench it overlooks this huge valley <clears throat> and so I, I'd like to be there right when the sun's coming up and of course everybody sees the videos and watch you know watches all the TV shows and 
they're thinking you got to do these locator calls and all that. And so we're sitting up there and we're watching the sun come up and we're at 12,000 feet. And so Chance is like, hey, man, you going to bugle? I'm like, no. Why not? I said, because I don't have to. So five minutes goes by, dude, you're supposed to bugle right now. And I'm like, no. I'm like, just give it. I said, when the sun comes up, they'll do their own thing. And that way they don't know where we're at. <clears throat> so this happened three or four times. You know, he's getting kind of frustrated because we're not elk hunting, you know. Right. <laughs> and so, so the sun comes up and sure enough, like five or six bulls pop off, you know, and two of them are really close. And, and so I'm like, hey, just stay with me. I know where there's a trail. I know right where these bulls are at. And there was this big avalanche area and we get on the trail and, and we get, I mean, we slide in there to like 60 yards. And of course, chances, I don't know what, six, two, maybe six, three. And I'm not, <laughs> you know, I'm like <laughs> five, nine, five, ten. And uh, so I'm like, there he is, man. I see he's kind of downhill, 61 yards, do it. And, you know, th they were pretty good bulls, you know, they're 300 inch bulls and he pulls back and, and it was all surreal, you know, it was like, here I am guiding one of the world's best archers in the world, you know, in my backyard. And, and, and we had a little different connection because we're friends and, and he shoots and man, he shoots right underneath this pole. Oh. Of course he was with PSE back then. He is, I've never seen him get mad ever in my life. He takes the bow and like tosses it and we're on this incline. And it's not like a five or 10 yard toss. It's like a 50 yard toss. It's oh, like going down the mountain. Of course, Emily's laughing. I'm kind of laughing. So we, we go on and we hunt the rest of the day. Well, at that particular place, we can go home every night. So I get home and, and my ex-wife at the time, you know, everybody. At that point, I think Chance had won Vegas maybe three times. And uh, so anyway, we walk in the door and, and everybody's like, hey, did you get one? And, and, and Emily goes, Chance missed one at 61 yards today. And, she, and my ex-wife goes, well, if you'd have put an X on his ass, he'd have hit it. <laughs> <laughs> so I never let him let that down, ever. I never let him live that down. So, But, uh, and, you know, he's gone on to kill some giant bulls and bucks. He, man, that guy consistently kills giant bucks every year. So he still won't tell me where he's hunting in Indiana. So he's always taking giants out of there. So but anyway, yeah. 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 Got a good spot. Don't want to let anybody know. <laughs> yeah. I, well, he, I think he's using a God service, but I'm not sure which one he's using. So I'm not going to promote it because I haven't been there. So <laughs> I have to still hunt public land in Indiana. But anywho. So what else you want to know? <laughs> oh, you got quite, quite a, a story of uh, your archery journey. It's just, it's amazing what you've done. And, and, uh, you know, out of all of that, you know, all of all my, I guess we can call them successes, but, you know, when my daughter was growing up, she wasn't very athletic, and I got her started shooting really young, like four or five years old, and, and by the time she was eight or nine, you know, she wasn't into sports or any of that, and we, you know, we lived in a small little mountain town, and I will give a shout out to, a, it's called the Ski and Bow Rack in Pagosa Springs. And if you've ever hunted the San Juans down there, everybody knows where that place is. And it only has six lanes. It's, it's a small, I mean, when the snow starts falling, it stops being a hunting store, becomes a ski store. You know, you rent skis and snowboards and stuff like that there. But um, so when she was about eight, a couple of her little friends wanted to learn archery. And so, you know, I started on like Tuesday nights and I, and I started with, five or six kids and and um and that was so she was 2000 so like 2010 maybe I started doing that well in 2012 I probably had 40 kids in that program and and by the time when I left in 2015, we had almost 100 kids in the program and it went from Tuesday nights to where Monday nights was beginners. Tuesday night was advanced shooters, and and then on Wednesday or Thursday nights, my advanced shooters helped the up and coming shooters. And 
And, uh, you know, and so anytime we would go to a 3D shoot or whatever, I mean, we looked like a carnival coming to town. It was hilarious. <laughs> but, you know, getting to take those kids to, you know, I would always take five or six kids every year to Vegas. And, you know, doing that was was probably one of the most rewarding things to watch them kids shoot. Um, Vegas always tears me up. I, you want the real pressure in the world? Go to Vegas. That's I, I would rather have the new world record bull standing in front of me at 60 yards than, you know, the final day at Vegas. That just something about that. But um, but watching those kids with ice in their veins doing that and you know, the first year we ever did it out of the six kids, I want to say four of them placed. You know, that's I think good. my daughter ended up second that year. And, and uh, so that's between doing that and, you know, a lot of those kids still reach out to me today. They're, you know, some of them are even doctors now, you know, and, and, uh, and have grown and started families and doing their thing. And, you know, it's really nice to, to have them reach out every now and again and, but, but probably the, the one big thing that I've taken out of archery is all the friendships and, and all the people that I've been able to introduce to the sport. You know, um, it's just, there's nothing like it. There's nothing, there's nothing else like it in the world. There's just not. not I mean, you know, when, when you're shooting tournaments, that's a little different, but the camaraderie even, you know, I shoot in the senior pro class and, um, you know, the camaraderie there is still just as strong today as it was, you know, 25 years ago uh, or even longer. But, um, you know, getting to help new people and, and get started on their journey in archery. And one of the things, anybody that I help is like brand new, you know, I'll loan equipment or I'll, you know, I help them set up stuff and all that. And, and everybody, everybody's like, Hey, what can I pay you? Or what can I do for you? And all that. And, and my, my go-to on that every time is just pay it forward. You know, if, if you see a kid that needs something, give it to him, you know, let them do it. So, <clears throat> because, <clears throat> you know, I, I think archery right now is probably in one of the strongest places it's ever been. I think, I mean, according to licenses and social media and all that, I mean, what do you think about that? No, archery is definitely making a, a good, strong presence. Uh, you know, you see a lot of uh, stuff on TikTok, you know, people shooting their bows and, and, you know, just everything else. I, I think it's, it's starting to be pretty good. And, and, like, archery in schools is you know picking right. up pretty good and, and growing and you know it's been growing for you know quite a while and you know that's something that you know that's just get them introduced in it I know I had some archery classes I took when I was in school and uh, you know it's, okay it's, it's always uh, 4-H uh, right yeah well it was a little after that okay All right. <laughs> I was a little bit older um, okay can't remember if I was in high school or college. I, it kind of all okay. blurs together, you know. Now, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been too many years, but I remember uh, uh, shooting in uh, in uh, school and uh, with my my brother. He got the first compound. He got the bear whitetail too. No, oh, okay, yeah. And, and that's the first <laughs> compound I shot in the seventies. But I started in the sixties with a Ben Pearson fiberglass recurve. Bow. Me too, man. You know, Me too. So. Twenty five pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, mine was 45. I could, I was probably only pulling about 20, but it was 45. So, but you remember the first deer you killed? Did you kill a deer with that? Uh, no, I didn't. It was, it was later um, when I got my own compound bow. Um, you know, the, the, the first time I had a shot at a deer, you know, being up in a tree stand and there was kind of brush there and I didn't really know yeah, how to shoot them or anything or where to shoot them. And it's like, right. it, was my, it was a perfect shot, but I didn't know that I could <laughs> shoot that shot. You know, I, you know, I didn't see all the deer. I, yeah. I didn't see the vitals, but, <laughs> you know, not knowing. And, you know, that was the first deer I seen. And then the first deer I shot was, uh, um, I was at a public land. I was 20 feet up in the tree on a tree stand and and I'd get that high to get over the brush there to get to the trail, which is about 40 <laughs> yards away. 
and yeah. and I'm shooting uh, 52 pounds, a full length 2117 arrow with 145 grain broadhead on it, muzzy yeah. broadhead. Yeah. And I shot, and you know, 52 pounds when that deer turned, I seen the arrow almost all the way through. I think the fletching stopped it from coming out. So here's yeah. this arrow sticking out. Is it run off? And I watched where it run. And then, then of course, the tall grass. I want to get. I knew where it went to. I could have went went there, but I want to track it. You know, get practice right. tracking because yeah. I never tracked a deer. I had never shot one. <laughs> you know, yeah. so I followed, yeah. tracked it, and got to it. And a buddy of mine, he just went down that that there. They had, they had mowed a little strip. Well, they, they the deer run through the uh, the grass, and and he found it. But I wanted to track to it and find it. <laughs> cool that's so cool yeah that was the first one and you know not a big big buck but hey <laughs> it was a deer my, my first was with with that oh uh ben or uh yeah ben pearson and um i was i think i was 11 and you know like i said there wasn't tree stands back then so you had to build tree stands and stuff and somebody had built an old tree stand by a cornfield and and so my dad's like, look, go down the edge of the cornfield. You'll see the tree stand, get up in it. And he goes a little bit before dark, just come right back down the edge of the cornfield. Well, you know, I wasn't real comfortable in the dark. So I got down probably a little earlier than I was supposed to. And, and you know, I've got an arrow knock and I'm shooting like, a, gosh, probably like an old double X 75 or something or yeah. maybe for pre that even. And I had a two blade bent Fred Bear blade on there. <clears throat> and I heard this ch -ch coming out of the woods to the corn and this doe walks out at like 10 yards and turns and faces me and I'm shaking so bad and I've kind of snapshot her and so I was aiming at the front of her and when I shot she ducked and it hit her in the top of the head <laughs> oh. <laughs> and she dropped like a bag of potatoes it just dropped scared the snot out of me like, cause I'd never shot anything, you know, I, I didn't know what was supposed to happen. So I'm, I'm yelling across this cornfield into my dad. I'm like, dad. And, uh, he's like, what? I said, I got one. And dad, dad caught it. I'll never forget. It. He's like bull, you know, out <laughs> loud. And, uh, and I said, no, I got one. And so neither one of us had ever killed a deer. So he comes over and pulls out his knife, cuts the throat, you know, because that's what you're supposed to do. And we mangled that deer, bless its heart. I mean, I don't know. I don't even know if we got any edible meat out of it, but we mangled it pretty good. But uh, that was my first experience. And, you know, it wasn't until, it wasn't until I got out of the army that, you know, the whole buck fever thing, I used to get that so bad. Oh my gosh. And then once I was in the military and did all that, it, you know, I, I don't, I get, I get excited after the shot. Now it's, it's during the shot. I get mad at them now for all the money I've spent trying to kill them. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, so I just get mad at them. And then I get excited after I shoot them. So but anyway, but yeah, no, I, uh, I'm, I'm, I've been very blessed. I've been very fortunate and, you know, with, with all the people that's come in and out of my life through archery is just, just been amazing. So, you know, I, I, I don't think I would have wanted it any other way, really. So still out there plugging away at it, even in my age. So yeah, I, I can tell you the eyes aren't what they used to be. <laughs> so, oh no. Yeah. That, that's, especially that's shooting where, a scope. <laughs> yeah. That's where, you know, the long shots, yeah, I'm I'm not making long shots because I can't see the target. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I definitely got to have a scope on if I'm doing long stuff. So, but <clears throat> and I I'll be honest with you, the last I don't know four or five years, like especially out if I'm out west mule deer hunting in the high country, I'll throw on like a a two or four power lens. You know, it's a pain in the butt to keep them clean for seven, eight, ten days, but. Um, but then when I'm around here deer hunting, I, I just, I don't even use a lens most of the time. So, but it, shooting tournaments, the older I get, you know, of course your eyes go weird. You know, here's these guys, these young pros, they're not even shooting. Some of them don't even shoot lenses, you know. And if they do, it's like a two power or whatever. 
And, uh, you know, here I am trying to figure out how to make an eight power lens work, you know, on a 3D. <laughs> yeah. the whole thing looks like this. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So, it's, cause I'm just trying to see anything, <laughs> but it's, uh, you know, the last few years have been a challenge, but you know, it's been, it's been fun. So, uh, with all the guys and everything, I just still enjoy getting out there and mixing it up with them. So, the, the the only time you want me to shoot with you apparently is on uh, is on Fridays when they shoot the team shoots. I do pretty good at that for some reason. So and I shoot real good on Saturdays, but the Sundays always I don't know. It's a mental thing, I guess. So <laughs> always something wow. on Sunday. Yes, yeah. I'm trying to get home. <laughs> so, well, but. archery is definitely a mental game in in you know yeah. how you're focusing your attention and. Uh, you know, there, there's so many things that can go wrong in, in your shot process, and it and a lot of it starts, you know, right oh, here in, in the head. You know, exactly right. you know, you know, you you take yourself out of the game, and you know that that's where, uh, you know, there's there's some people that have gotten that down where you know they're just focused on one thing, and you know, I I found when I'm out shooting, if I'm thinking anything else while I'm shooting, yeah, I can't even hit the backstop hardly. Right. You know, yeah. No, I'm, not, I'm, that. I'm not thinking about it. And, you know, that's one of the things, you know, I, I've been teaching archery since 95. So I've right. taught a lot of people how to shoot. And, you know, that that's that's something it's it's completely different game when you're trying to teach somebody how to shoot. And, you, you know, I I did martial arts for over 20 years and I yeah. was doing that when I learned, you know, the back tension release, you know, the, the current way of, of shooting and right. I kind of merged them in together to get a little, a little bit different because I teach slightly different, you know, stance a little bit different. I keep teach more of a closed stance. Yeah. And, and I teach, you know, the hand, when you shoot, she goes straight to your target. Right. You know, if you're off at an angle, when you shoot, your hand wants to go out. Right. You can't be consistent. So I teach to go straight to the target, you know, that as, makes sense. as you do it. And, you know, when, you know, just like, you know, martial arts, you're breaking a board. If you don't go straight at that board, and go through it you're gonna hurt your hand right you know, what yeah. are you hitting it with right. you know where if you go straight through it you know you focus not at the board but beyond the board you know that's where you know aren't you want to focus on the target not the pin right the pin's gonna move right who cares what the pin's doing you just want to yeah. focus on where you want it to go and yeah. you know a lot of visualization and it's all just kind of a you know a mindset and you know when i'm out doing seminars and stuff you know, most of the time, these guys want me to talk about backpack bow hunting because I've been doing that since, <clears throat> you know, the, the early 90s. And, um, you know, and people go, so what's the number one thing that will take you out of a hunt when you're, you know, in a wilderness area or, <clears throat> or up in the mountains or doing whatever, you know, for more than three or four days? And <clears throat> I tell them all the time, it's mental. You know, um, nine times out of ten, if, if, if there's anything going wrong in your, in your life, you know, if your finances, your wife, your job, or any of those things aren't right, you know, when you're on an eight day hunt somewhere and it's just you and your backpack, you know, the first two or three days you're on an adventure. It's fun. Everything's new and, you know, you're hunting and you're doing all that. But when day four runs around and now you're hunt, you know, you're hungry and you may not be seeing the animals you're looking for. And, and, um, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, when you're hunting with a group, you've got other guys there to keep you interested in what's going on. But when you're by yourself, you know, and you, and, and people might go, well, if you're talking to yourself, you're crazy. Well, you're always talking to yourself, always. Right. And so when you're on the side of a mountain and that little voice in your head starts talking to you, yourself is not going to lie to yourself. You, you can't, you, you know, you can't tell yourself a lie because you know you're telling yourself a lie. And so, you know, it's a total mental game. And so, you know, by day four or five, if you're not mentally ready for what's about to happen, you know, then you start thinking about cheeseburgers and pizza, and, you know, <laughs> good cold beer would be good, you know. And so, you know, that and, and any other problems you might be having, you know, that, that takes you out of the game immediately. And it's, it's the same for archery. I mean, if you're in a tournament situation, 
you know, it, everything at that time has to be mentally correct. You know, you can't have any side thoughts going on. And, and I think I tell people all the time, I mean, these guys that are the best in the world, they're either, <clears throat> they either have prepared so well that they know everything that they need to know or they're brain dead. I mean, they just don't think of nothing and they go do their thing. <clears throat> and so, you know, I'm, I've never, <clears throat> I wish I was more brain dead, but I, I think too much when I shoot tournaments. <laughs> so I do. And, and that's probably my biggest downfall when it comes to, to shooting, you know, the, the big stuff. But when it comes to shooting animals, it's not a problem. It's just something about them 12 rings just, just eat me up. So, but anyway, so, and I think that's why I was so successful shooting a recurve because you don't have all those, you know, those five other things you're thinking about, you know, you're just looking down the arrow and getting with it. So, you know, you're kind of wanting to hit this area at 30 yards, but, you know, the probability is not as good as when you're, you know, you got a six power scope on there and you're looking at it, you know? Right. So, and everything has to go off right. So, but yeah, but no, you know, my career, I've, you know, I've gotten to the point now where I've killed about everything I've wanted to kill. There's still a few hunts out there. I, I think Justin and I are thinking maybe a moose hunt in 2024 up in Alaska. Um, uh, you know, I, I want to go to the Yukon really bad. So, and we're thinking about doing one of those 10 day float trips and, you know, at 57, 58 years old, that might be one of the last of those I get to do. Cause <laughs> I, I know my days are numbered in the mountains. I, I get that this, this past time in Colorado, man, I mean, things hurt a lot, especially legs and backs. So, yeah, <laughs> but <laughs> And so, you know, I try to stay in pretty good shape, and, you know, and exercise regular and eat, try to eat right and all that. But, um, you know, there comes a time where, you know, you just, you got more days behind you than you do in front of you. And, right. And when, it, and when it comes to hunting out West and doing that sort of stuff, it's even fewer days in front of you. So, <laughs> but I, that, I may have to break down and buy horses. So. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's one way of doing it. Yeah. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at right now. So, <laughs> but uh, no, just enjoying life down here in Tennessee and, you know, doing a lot of deer hunting, you know, when I'm not elk hunting and bear hunting and stuff. And, um, you know, love being back down South and got, you know, just honestly, you could probably shoot two or three tournaments a weekend locally if you wanted to. And being down here in Nashville, you know, we, we've had maybe one or two snowstorms all year that lasted three days. So, I mean, <clears throat> you know, for the most part, you can go shoot just about any weekend you want to, which is a big plus. So, yeah. 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 It's, it's a little tough shooting tournaments this time of year up here in Nebraska because we're <laughs> right now today we're in, we're in single digits. <laughs> nice. Yeah. With, yeah. with, with uh, the wind chills in single digits, but below zero. <laughs> wow. You probably see a vapor trail with an arrow. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> well, and then too, you know, when it's that cold, you know, your limbs are a little stiffer. So yeah. now you're actually pulling a little bit more weight. Mm -hmm. uh, your arrows are, are stiffer, you know, because they're, they're cold, yeah. especially been out there for a while, you know, and then you have to worry about your veins or your feathers. I always shoot feathers. I've, yeah, I've just never switched the veins. Nice uh, for me. I just, I just I shoot four inch feathers. That's yep. what I I shoot. That's what I shoot. And uh, you know, then not only that, but you're cold. Right. You know, you're a little stiff. And yeah, I will it, tell you, I won't know how that feels because I'm not going to shoot in the kind of weather you're in. <laughs> just not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah my back stuff's cold. outside, and and I, yeah. yeah, I'm not going to shoot it right now. <laughs> yeah, I get it. So, well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's about me in a nutshell. You know, I've, you know, if I could say anything, I've just been very blessed. So, but, and, um, you know, if there's anybody out there, look me up on, you know, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, all them places, you know, uh, got a few things on YouTube, not many, uh, 
the one that I get the most talk about is my fire truck shot. Uh, I guess probably back in 2010 or 12 or somewhere in there, I was in Pagosa Springs and the county got a new fire truck with a hundred foot ladder on it. And, and I had the Hoyt rep there and, and I had a booth at the county fair and, and um, the Hoyt rep was there. And we're trying to, you know, do stuff with the youth archery program. And I went over to the fire chief and I'm like, hey, man, what's the chances of uh, letting me go up on top of that ladder and shoot one of them targets? And he goes, how far is the target? And I said, 104 or five yards. And he goes, can you do that? I said, yeah, I think so. And uh, he goes, I can put you up to 80 feet if you can get the fairgrounds to say you can do it. So I went and talked to them. I said, hey, uh, do you care if I try this? And they're like, well, what are we going to do with everybody? I said, just make a lane. And, uh, and so if you watch the video, it's pretty cool. I, I was up about 80, 85 feet and shot like 104 yards. And, and the rep from Hoyt was there. And he's kind of an older guy. After my second arrow, <laughs> he goes, uh, you might want to stop there, Jeff. He goes, uh, you know, of course, I couldn't hear him. And um, and so it was that was that's probably the one everybody talks about is the fire truck <laughs> shot. So, <laughs> but I, I've not killed many animals off of the top of a fire truck. So. <laughs> no. So, so did you hit the target then? I did. There was a deer target and a javelina target. Now, I want to say I put four or five arrows. I had five arrows, I think, and put them all in it. So, and and That's actually, good. actually, I think four of them are in the scoring ring. So you know, maybe <laughs> a high eight. I don't know. So, yeah, it's not too bad. But I was shooting a six power scope, so I'm not gonna lie. Oh, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so, but I had I had a harness on. So if you do watch the video, the harness makes me look much fatter than I really am. <laughs> oh, yeah, up that high that. yeah you're gonna yeah. make you put a harness on <laughs> yeah so no that yeah. that was kind of fun and you know on youtube i i i, I look, turkey hunting has always been my first passion you know i grew up doing it and love it and you know it's it's basically elk hunting it is but it's a bird you know and um you know um uh, so I, I, there's a lot of like misses turkey misses up there because i think people need to see that too um there's a lot of good footage of you know high country mule deer and some uh i've had i've been fortunate to kill some giant black bears out west and uh that's kind of one of my things i like to do is i love to bear hunt um <clears throat> of course you know mule deer hunt elk hunt and, and then you know when whitetail season rolls around I've, I've got a couple farms up in kentucky and i've got one here in tennessee that i get to hunt and and so, you know, I, I like trying to grow deer and, you know, I grew up with Spook Span and Spook Nation and all that. And so, uh, you know, he's the same way. He, he grows some giant deer. And uh, so I, <clears throat> I try to cheat off of him and learn what he's doing. So, but uh, yeah, so that's, that's me in a nutshell now. I mean, this year, um, I want to say Justin and I have, I'm not sure. I have to look it up, but we either have four or six mule deer points for down there around Pagosa Springs. And, and in Colorado, that's one of the big, big units to go kill giant mule deer. And um, <clears throat> that's a hard hunt. It's tough. It's, you know, you're a little over 13,000 feet. You're above Timberline. And it's just, uh, if I, if we draw that this year, uh, then I'll definitely, you know, that'll probably be one of the last times I get to do that just because stuff hurts right now, you know, yeah. backs and knees and joints and, and, you know, that hike up to that 13,000 feet, it's, you know, it's three or four vertical, three or 4,000 vertical feet. And I mean, it's going to take me five or six hours to get up there. So, and then once you're there, you're there. But we've also agreed that if we don't draw that tag this year, then we're going to, unless they change it, we're going to do a over-the-counter elk hunt somewhere on the eastern side of Colorado over there where I used to guide. I, I kind of miss going over there. So, <clears throat> and then, uh, yeah, and then, you know, try to maybe get in a Kansas or Oklahoma hunt for deer. And um, we might apply for that whitetail tag out in eastern Colorado. That is a place where 
that is a hidden gem. I mean, there is some giant, giant whitetails roaming around, and it's almost a hundred percent draw. And uh, but it's you kind of really have to know where to go because there's not a lot of public land out there, and so you really got to do your homework and you know Google scout it and do all that kind of mess. But um, it's a really a hidden gem. I mean, we've and I've got some YouTube videos on there. <clears throat> I mean, there's I've seen two hundred and six, eight, you know, inch bucks out there running around, and it's just wide open spaces, and it's a tough hunt. But you know, if if you can get in the right place at the right time, then you know it's it's a great hunt. So, and then of course you know you got tons of antelope and mule deer running around, but the whitetails out there are just a different different breed and so <clears throat> it's it's a really good hunt too so but yeah a lot, lot of good hunting around a lot of deer you know as the turn of the century they didn't ever figure whitetail would be a viable game animal and, and now know. look at it there's there's so many that were you know they're they're getting diseases because there's so many and right yeah no i get it yeah i mean <clears throat> i think here in tennessee you can kill three bucks and you can kill three does a day, a day. So I, I, I did the numbers. It's over 300. You can kill 300 deer a year. So if, if you wanted to do that. So um, I have no desire to shoot that many deer. So. <laughs> no. But, the, the hauling out in the field dressing and then oh cleaning them up. And, yeah. and then I always process my own just because I'm cheap and I want to make sure I get my meat back right you take, yeah. them, you take them to a thing and uh you know the, one of the the butchers and you don't even know if you get your own meat back and right uh yeah. you know i, I had I had one guy he's took in a huge huge like 300 pound three so over 300 pounds and another but of mine took you know a little bit more normal you know 150 180 um pound you know pound deer and yeah. they pick up their deer and they both got the same amount of meat back. Oh, that's not good. I know. I guess, uh, wait a minute. You know, I brought in over 300 pound deer. So they went and grabbed some more meat. <laughs> wow. Yeah. You know, I do a lot of my own stuff. I, I have a butcher that I use up in Kentucky, actually. <clears throat> and so what I'll do is the stuff I want into hamburger, I'll just take him that meat. It's already weighed. And he makes this special hamburger for me. That's pretty cool. <clears throat> but other than that, everything else, I pretty much do my own stuff. So, cause I'm the same way. I don't really want anybody else messing with it. <laughs> so, well, but. and I've been in some of those places too. You go in and look at it. Some of these deer hangings, but during rifle season, there's, there's lots and lots of them in, you know, yeah. they're just packed full hanging there. And, and you look at some of these and okay, this meat's not only real dark, but it's also a little green. You know, and oh, then apple yeah. gets mixed in with everything else. And then mm. you and a grind are gonna grind everybody's all up. The other give you back, you know, you know, if you've got five pounds of ground, they're gonna grind it. Bring off fine, give you five pounds, and yeah, uh, you know, and, and you can always tell the difference between the way they smell and the way they taste mm -hmm. when they process it into ground is when I yeah. do because right. I take out all the fat, all the membrane, you know, yeah. So I have pure meat in there where theirs has got the fat mixed in with it. And as you know, you don't eat deer fat. Right, no. Mm -mm. No, it's, it, no, it doesn't smell good or taste good when you when you have it in there. So That's you want to get all that fat out of there. And um, Oh, I bet it's been probably, gosh, I don't want to lie to you, but I, I bet it's been 10 or 15 years since I've bought meat at a grocery store. I mean, all I eat is deer, elk, you know, um, <clears throat> that, you know, the only thing I'll buy, to grow, I'll buy some pork and chicken. That's about it. So everything else is wild game. So, but <clears throat> no, I, I feel I'm, I'm the same way as you are on that. I don't want anybody messing with it. So, and, you know, and, and what's cool is, you know, by doing that, you, you also learn so much about what you're, how you're shooting the animal and, you know, the best field care and, you know, deer tastes different that, you know, that you've had to let lay for a day or so than the ones that you watch drop, 
you know right. so um so you know being able to prepare it like that's you know always something you know that's that's the thing about elk hunting you know when you kill an elk up in the mountains that for me i mean it don't get any better than elk meat and so you know taking care of that meat is always priority for me i mean that's the most important you can have my whole entire camp as long as i get all the meat out you know what i'm saying yeah, so that right. i mean taking the meat out is for me is and preparing it and, and doing right by it is is probably my number one goal so after i get one down because you, you just don't moose i have yeah moose is really good so yeah <laughs> yeah it's the best so yeah i, I went up canada and got a moose and, and man it was it was so good <laughs> yeah yeah hopefully in 2024 i'll i'll know what that feels like so you know and i don't even know need to go kill some giant new world record i just just a good representative would be good with me so you know as long as we can go in there and kill one and not get beat by a grizzly I'm, that'd be a good week for me so right i've had a lot of crazy bear encounters and you know i've always said that's probably how i'll go out getting eaten by a bear so because <laughs> i don't know they seem to like me a lot i don't know so seems like everywhere i go there's always bears around <laughs> so but and i've gotten kind of used to how they operate and how they act and how they should act i mean this this place that we hunted last time in colorado you have to go through this little valley to get up to to where we want to hunt and, <clears throat> and there's a i don't want to use the word river it's more like a large creek but goes through there and there's raspberries everywhere and as you're hiking through there there was literally three two or three bears just sitting in the middle of these raspberries like they were at the movies eating popcorn you know <laughs> and we're coming through there with packs and making noise they don't even move they're they're having such a good time they're just doing their thing and um you know and so when you do kill an elk up there and you got to come back through there you know, you're like, okay, are they going to give up the raspberries for the elk meat that you have on your back? You know, <laughs> so so you always got to be, you know, pretty conscious of what's going on out there doing that too. So, but yeah, yeah, we so, don't have bears here in Nebraska, so <laughs> yeah, don't have to worry about that. We do have lions, we only though. have them in East <laughs> Tennessee. We don't have them where I'm at, but we have them in East Tennessee. They're small though. You can slap them bears around a little bit. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah i don't think i'd slap a bear <laughs> yeah unless yeah. it's unless it's a stuffed one <laughs> yeah yeah i got a youtube video on there me chasing one up a tree so <laughs> out in colorado but yeah anyway as long as you don't get them cornered right <laughs> that's right leave mama alone you'll be all right so right yep yeah Leave, leave them alone they're a big animal and that's you know, it unless you give them a reason to attack you now are you up there where you're at are they, are they doing that tack tournament up there at total archery challenge aren't they doing one of those up there by you you know i haven't kept up with that i'm i'm gonna have to check that out okay um oh man me and me and justin walski went to one a couple of years ago uh over in east tennessee right it's kind of in the hill country before you get in the mountains and and man you want you want a challenge go shoot one of those holy cow like each range is like four miles and you gain and lose like i want to say we gain and lost maybe 1500 feet in elevation like it's just up and down all day long and you're shooting targets from Bob White Quail at 20 yards to Sasquatches at 140 yards. I mean, it's and you you shoot. I think it's 50 targets, and they have three or four ranges, and they have like this whole village thing going on. And and uh, boy, did we we had a, I had a great time doing that. I know the one out west they do in uh, Utah. That's always a good one too. So. But I, I thought I saw where they were coming up there by you guys. But if you, if they do, you should go. It's, yeah, <laughs> it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So, 
a lot of work yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. I'll, I'll have to check that out and and, yeah. and see. You know, there, there's so many things in in archery going on between ISO. Oh. You know, the a, ATA and all yeah. the different organizations and NASP and there's just so yeah. many things going on. It's hard to keep track of all of them. And, it is. Know, that's what nice about you know. Each person has their own thing to deal with it. So I can kind of learn from all you guys as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you know, I, I that's why I said earlier, I think archery's in a good place. I really do. I think I think where it's going's a good thing. And um, you know, I'm I'm just I'm really proud that that I've had the, the opportunities I've had and the friendships that I've met through it and um, uh, you know, some of the experiences that I've gotten to have and you know, like I said earlier, I've just, I've been really blessed to be able to do all that. So, and, uh, you know, I, at this point in my life, it's all about giving back. And so I, I try to do that as much as I can now. So, but, and, you know, keep plugging away until I can't plug away anymore. So, right. No, that's yeah. all we can do. That's it. Yeah. Just, so, just keep going. And, you know, yeah. and, and that's why, you know, I started this podcast a little over a year ago, and yep. you know, I called it Arch Talk 101 because I wanted to help new archers that don't know what's going on. Uh, you know, I started out, you know, it's like, what do you need to know before you even go to the archery store? Right. And then what do you yeah. need to know once you get there? And, you know, so that somebody that's looking at archery don't get sucked into, you know, some of the store owners like, okay, well, you need this, you need this, you need this. And by the time they get done, they're walking out $2,000 on their bow. And, yeah. um, and, you know, beginner don't need that no you no, know you're right when i had my store you know my the psc no i was a psc dealer yeah and the psc nova was like a 350 dollar set yeah and you know you could buy them from walmart stuff like that but there's a little bit cheaper but there's included a bow with the rest right. of the site and that was it yeah well to not compete with walmart uh, i also included half dozen arrows a release, oh. string silencers, a peep, and shooting instruction. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, you know, could be an archery instructor, you know, I, I'm going to teach them how to shoot. I'm going to get them in this bow for about 350 maybe $400 back then. Now yep. it's probably about six, $700 to get started. But It's hard to walk um, out of there under $1,000 anymore. Right. right. <clears throat> Even with but, lesser equipment. Yeah, you know, yep. but you got to remember that was... 20 years ago. <laughs> right. Yeah. So you can get yeah. by a little bit cheaper. And, yeah. you know, and then, you know, like on a stabilizer, you know, here's a cheap stabilizer. Here's a bit more. Here's a real expensive one. You know, we put them on, try it's like, can you tell the difference? Nope. Buy the cheap one then. Yeah. You yeah. know, don't don't spend the extra money. Now later, once you shop for a while, you'll be able to tell the difference. Now then, yeah. you know, not only that, but that allowed them to get in cheaper till they can get going, know what they needed. They can upgrade their site. They can upgrade their rest. They can upgrade pieces at a time. When they upgrade the bow, just move them all over. Um, and, you know, if I sold you the high-end one, I'm going to sell you one bow in your lifetime. I'm probably right. going to sell you another one. If I right. sell you the low-end one, you stay in the sport, I'm going to sell you another bow. Right. I'm or going to two. sell you more accessories. <laughs> yeah, or two. Yeah. You know? yeah. And That's true. You know, and then yeah. I, I went through and I didn't have any fletched arrows. There was all custom ordered. Mm -hmm. You know, I just bought raw shafts and you want veins, you want feathers, you want four inch or five inch feathers, you want three or four inch veins, you know, then they didn't have all these little fancy veins right. they have out now. Yeah. And, you know, what colors you want, you know, you pick your colors that way every, every archer can have their own color scheme. You know, now, you know, when I worked at Bass Pro and Cabela's, you buy a box of a dozen arrows, they right. cut and glue the inserts in, you, you don't get to pick what veins you want. Right. You don't get to pick which colors, you know, you, you can't pick a different color. You can't pick a different knock. You can't pick nothing. And, and now I made them all custom. That's right. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, it's funny to go to these tournaments and especially with the, the young ladies out there. Like when I say young ladies, I'm talking like from 12 years old to 35, you know, or, or even 50, the 50 year old women are doing it too. I mean, it, it's like going to a dead gum fashion show. I right. mean, the pants, the shoes, the shirt, the hat, all match the bow, you know, the, 
they have the bow with the bling on it and this and this and i'm like good gracious a lot i like it's like buying a new car almost i mean it's crazy yeah so, but it's fun to watch it's fun to watch everybody i mean and i'm guilty of it too i mean you know my and <clears throat> some some of your listeners may or may not know this but in 2018 in kentucky my daughter we had a school shooting there and my daughter was shot twice um the, the anniversary the five-year anniversary was just uh, the 23rd and so the that year that that happened the little girl that passed away was my daughter's best friend in that shooting and like I said my daughter was shot twice and their favorite colors were purple and pink and so that for the next two years that's all I shot was purple and pink you know fletches and of course you know you get all these guys talking snot to you you know and, oh you're this you're that da, 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 da. and then when you tell them you know why you're doing it boy that makes them feel about that tall you know right so, <laughs> you know so you're like there have that one so yeah, but yeah yeah i mean it's it's really amazing what you can do with all that i mean you know like the sites now you can put different colored you know rings in there to match your bow and and um I've, and I've always been guilty of the, the, of the fletching thing, you know, to match everything else going on. So I, I can't, I can't lie about that, but yeah, it's funny. So yeah, I mean, it's boy, you talking about <clears throat> just in the last 10, 15 years, this, this whole archery game has just been revolutionized. It's just crazy, you know? And I mean, it just keeps getting faster and faster and faster. And it's like, when does it stop? You know, like how much can y'all reinvent, you know, from one year to the next, because, you know, used to a, a manufacturer would come out with, you know, whatever bow. And that was the bow for like two years, three years. Right. And now it's like, seems like there's a new bow every six months. They're like telephones. So it's like, right. So uh, it's kind of weird to me, really, but I don't know. I'm I'm just one of those guys that I'm pretty old school. I don't I don't get caught up in all the. I mean, the one thing that I do get caught up in is when I build I build my own arrows, and so you know, all the way from cutting them to weighing them, and I mean, all my target arrows are down within you know half a grain of each other, so. Um, especially my indoor arrows, <clears throat> but um, so I, I do enjoy doing that. But other than that, everything else is is I keep it really simple. So because I'm not that smart, so I don't have time to sit around and you know think of all <laughs> the everything that has to happen. So, but I'm I'm not a Tim Gillingham for sure. That's for sure. So, but anyway what we ought to do is uh you know like in august call me or, and, or reach out to me and any of these guys are about ready to go out west for the first time or or who haven't been successful out there um you know we could we could definitely talk about gearing up for that you know and, yeah and, and that kind of stuff i'd love to do that with you so yeah you know how to prepare for a trip out west you know, mm -hmm. come closer to the season that, you know, that sounds like something they'd be definitely interested in is, uh, you know, yeah. how, how do you prepare for it? And yeah. Yeah. You know, I, uh, you know, I, when I do these seminars that, you know, for the fall classic and, and some of these other places around here, that's, that's basically what I talk about, you know, is bow hunting elk out West and mule deer and all that. And, and uh, cause it's a different game, you know, than if, these guys coming from back east and uh i used to tell people all the time you bring me michael jordan you know when he was in his prom i'm like you bring me michael jordan to colorado and i'm gonna kick his butt the first two days but once he catches his breath then it's a new game so right <laughs> but, yeah so but yeah i would love love to do something like that yeah um, that sounds like a, a good plan uh, okay um, you know sure we could we offer a lot of, a lot of good stuff like that in in the group so uh for yeah. those uh, that are with us so far just uh i remember if you go out to facebook the archer talk 101 facebook group that's a group i have set up for you know, helping archers out 
a lot of good information out there. You won't have to worry about being advertised to because I don't allow links in the group. So it's just all pure helping you out. And uh, you can ask questions. You can even upload a video and we'll give you a, a shout out to, you know, what we think you can help you with. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description, uh, as well as those that are interested in uh, archery coaching. I'll leave a link to a, a form you can fill out, get a free 15-minute consultation, see if coaching might be for you. Uh, that's kind of a little bit of my advertisement here. And uh, it's been great talking with you today. And you have any parting thoughts? Man, I think you're doing an amazing job. Keep it up. Um... You know, um, for anybody out there that's an old guy like us, you know, my, my biggest thing is just keep passing it forward, you know. Um, the, the sport don't grow unless we get the young people involved. So uh, that's kind of always been my motto. And and uh, now I'm just I'm proud of the work you're doing and uh, just keep it up. And uh, if anybody needs to reach out to me, like I said, I'm on Facebook or Instagram and uh, just shoot me a message and I'll be glad to help you in any way I can. So, all right. It's been right. great having you on the show. Looking forward to, to more of these, uh, uh, especially, you know, come closer to hunting season. How sure. do you prepare for them? I appreciate it. Thanks, Roy. Yeah. Yeah. All right. My name is Roy Canterbury and I've been the host on Arch Talk 101. And we'll, we'll see you the next one of these. So stay tuned and we'll, we'll uh, make sure we talk to you at a different time.